Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. A small business success story is always encouraging and always a fun story to hear about. But a small hardware business that started in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, in 1921 and has since now grown to over 300,000 employees with total revenues approaching 75 billion is really fun to talk about. <laughs> welcome, again, uh, welcome again to the most widely watched and longest running source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I'm Chris William and on this special executive profile, we will meet and chat with the president and chief executive officer of home improvement retailer Lowe's. Not only has this organization been a longtime corporate citizen here in the region, but this homegrown company seems to be reinventing some aspects of its core business while confirming the Carolinas legacy with a major IT campus investment in the Charlotte region. In a moment, a rare public media conversation with Marvin Ellison. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, an executive profile featuring Marvin Ellison, President and CEO of Lowe's. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, President Ellison, welcome. Thank you, great to be here. It's great to have you here. I'm just going through the beginning of the program, and as we just talked about, sir, uh, so Lowe's is this little hardware store in North Wilkesboro, and now you've got 310,000 employees, 75 billion in revenue, um, not just in the U.S. It's, it's, I mean, th the exponential growth, and that's probably understanding, is, is, is pretty dramatic. Now, you have been in place for a year, sir. Yeah. Um, what on day one when you first started at Lowe's, what was your what was your point of view then? What's your point of view now a year later? Well, well Chris, I think it's interesting. On day one, uh, I spent my first day working at the contractor's desk at a store in Dallas. Uh, there was a big electronic banner uh, at the at the home office welcoming me because they knew I was starting on you know beginning of July. And rather than come to the corporate office, I spent the first day at a contractor's desk wanting to understand how we were engaging that really important customer. Day two, I spent in the stock room at another store trying to understand how we received freight, how we prioritized getting inventory to the floor. Day three, I spent on the sales floor uh, getting trained on customer service and also understanding the process to get in stock and to present product to the customer. So, so that was my beginning. You know, I started out in retail uh, back when I was, you know, 20 years old making four dollars and 35 cents yeah. an hour and i've always felt that the best way to learn is is getting as close as you can to the customer and, and to what i call the front line uh employees and, and so that was my start but from that you know I, I i learned a couple of things i learned that we have great men and women that work for the company and i was surprised that we have so many managers assistant managers and even supervisors that have over 30 years of tenure with Lowe's, which which tells you that this is a company that has always cared about taking care of its employees, and, and that's been a positive thing. What I also learned on the negative side is that we, we'd fallen quite a bit behind on technology. Uh, we'd made capital investments in other things mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of had different priorities. And, and so in retail now, if you don't have a great technology foundation, it's hard to compete. 
because everything is digital, everything is cloud, because it gives you the ability to be agile and nimble. And so we're transitioning to, to more of a technology focus so we can make everything simple for the customers and simple for the employees. So even for, um, even given the size of Lowe's when you started a year ago, was it surprising, and it, of course this is my word, uh, Marvin, but was it, was it surprising the technology was that was it ancient was it that outdated for a sort a, a, a series of stores uh, yeah it was it's pretty outdated and, and and what what happens is the last five years you've had so many technology advancements that if you have not stayed current with you know e-commerce mm -hmm. with supply chain management with pricing with data analytics with machine learning and, and, and it's just in its basic foundational elements, you, you, you exponentially fall behind because everything's been accelerated the last five years. And during that time frame, the company had other you know, capital priorities. They made investments in international businesses. They made investments in other adjacent businesses that were not core retail businesses. And, and it was just a strategic difference uh, in philosophy. I felt I felt that it was important to get back focus on fundamental retail, you know, take care of the customers in the 1,724 U.S. stores that we have, not spend so much time on businesses that's not core to retail, uh, limit our ability to look at international and really focus on North America, uh, and then take that same capital we were spending on those initiatives and shift it all to help us improve our supply chain and improve our technology foundation. So we, we, I want to get to the IT piece because you clearly you made a big statement about two, a new 2,000 person yeah. IT tech center in, in the Charlotte region. But before we do that, I don't know a lot of people know you are an EVP at Home Depot. Yes. So you know the DNA of your biggest competitor. But you also spent uh, most recently at JCPenney that had a whole different set of, 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 series, of, of challenges. What did you learn from JCPenney as that was more of a, seemed like a dire situation to what you're coming now? Yeah, so I mean, JCPenney is one of the most iconic retailers in the world. Uh, you know, I grew up you know, shopping there along with other iconic retailers like Sears. Uh, and, and those two retailers you know, have in common that they, they fell on really difficult times. Luckily for JCPenney, uh, we were able to restructure a lot of debt. Uh, I think when I joined, we had $6 billion in debt, and we were able to pay off you know, almost $2 billion of that, uh, restructure a lot of debt to really give the company the ability to perform and have you know, the ability to have the next three to five years to kind of recover from some really poor management from, from, a, from a previous CEO. Uh, and, and also, we were able to take the company, I think when I started, we were a, our earnings per share was a negative $5.64 per share, uh, which is a pretty unique situation Going to be in. Going in the wrong way, yeah. <laughs> we were able, in the time I was there, to, to shift that to a positive $0.22 cents a share and positive cash flow. And, and, and so I'm really proud of the time I spent there. Uh, it was a, a difficult assignment, but I took the assignment because I believed I could help. Uh, having learned a lot uh, in a unique turnaround and CEO transition at Home Depot, uh, but also because I, I believe that the company deserved to have JCPenney around as a brand. And, and so the things I learned from that is really simple. Number one, you have to really understand who your core customer is, mm -hmm. and, and you have to understand how you serve that customer. Uh, number two, you have to ensure that you are delivering on the needs of the customer and understanding the changing dynamics of retail. Meaning as retail shifts from brick and mortar to e-commerce, you, you have to have strategies in place to make sure you can serve customers in the way that they desire to be served. And also I just learned the importance of the CEO talking directly to the frontline employees. Mm -hmm. Because what I found out quickly is that although the company was in a pretty difficult financial situation, you had a lot of employees that had no idea the company was losing money. Yeah, I, no, I bet, and which gets, gets to the point where you've been a little, and frustrated is my word, but you've been trying to figure out how your vision can become at least understood by the broader 300 plus thousand. Absolutely. Bef before we get to that though, so you made, a, you made a decision, Lowe's made an announcement recently, 2,000 plus or minus folks in an IT center in Charlotte in a, in a 20 plus story building. Yeah. How do you do that fiscally that's responsible for the company? Do you fund that through debt? Do you, do you, do you try to use some cash on hand? And then is that is that expected, Marvin, to do what you just talked about and that is to build the top line or is this some type of infrastructure build out? 
Yeah, great question. It's, it's a combination of both. So let me answer your question on how do we do it fiscally. So we made a commitment back last year that we were going to spend approximately $500 million in technology investment for the next five years. That's our commitment to get caught up. Part of that $500 million investment is this IT kind of global technology center that we're going to be putting on the south end of Charlotte. Yeah. We believe that in order for us to attract the best and brightest and to be able to start to build the right infrastructure and the right team for technology, we have to put our global location in a place that we would attract you know, world-class talent. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as proud as we are about our campus in Morrisville, when you think about the millennial type of, of prospective employee that we're gonna be trying to attract from around the world that, that wants to be a part of our team, what we've learned you know, quite specifically is that they're looking for a, an office location that's close you know, to an urban center mm -hmm. where they can walk to work, they can catch a light rail, they have access to restaurants, shops, you know, condos, you know, rental houses, apartments, so all of those things. And the South End gives us all of those things. And, and so this is an investment in the future. You know, what's interesting, we put up a micro site the moment we made the announcement at the end of June, within the first 24 hours, we had over 700 people from around the world to, to, to ping us on that site, requesting additional information so that they can look at it as a perspective, you know, employment situation. And, and so we're really pleased with the early response. We're pleased with the partnership from the city, the state, and the county to allow us to make this happen. And, and looking candidly, we had a pretty broad search. We looked at a lot of major cities in North America, uh, and we had a lot of city cities vying mm -hmm. for us to put this location there, but we felt strongly that Charlotte gave us exactly what we needed, and we're pleased mm -hmm. to be able to stay close to our hometown. That does it, so how, so let's fast forward five years, and you got the tech center up and running, and everything is moving a pro forma, as you, as you would expect. What do, you, what do you see that iTech being able to do? Does it close the gap between your, your commercial and your DIY customer? Does it make it easier? Does it make you more like Amazon? What does that do for you? Well, I think the most important thing that technology does for a retailer is it makes everything simple, simple for the customer to shop, buy, to return, to exchange, to make choices, and it makes it easier for the employees to do their job. When technology is really efficient, nobody pays attention to it. Yeah, right. It's all behind the scenes. And, and so now, it's, it's too much of a requirement for our associates, we call our employees associates, to do extra work to get things done that technology should enable to make it a lot more simplistic. We, we, we ask our customers to go through you know, too many steps in order to make a purchase online mm -hmm. or in order to come in and to get something special ordered or delivered, we want to be able to minimize that. You know, our goal is to serve customers in the most simplistic way any decision they make in how they want to shop from us. If they want to come to the store and buy it the old fashioned way, we want to make it easy. They want to order it online and have us deliver it to their house, we want it to be as fewer clicks as possible. You know, and if they want to order it online and come and pick it up from a store, we want that to be as simple as possible. And, and, and this investment enable, will enable us to do that in a way that we can have lower cost, we can have more efficient processes, and we can just create a more simplistic environment for our customers. Now, Amazon doesn't have any bricks and mortar. I know they've looked at it, but is Amazon the gold standard for you to achieve that? N not necessarily. I, I think when you, look at, when you look at our business, so the best way to think about Lowe's home improvement retail platform is roughly 5% of our revenue is e-commerce which means that 95% of it still happens the old-fashioned way mm -hmm. in the stores. Now, we think that 5% over the next three years may grow to 10%, but the home improvement retail format is a little different because just the sheer nature of what we sell, big, bulky, heavy, hard to ship, mm -hmm. in some cases hazardous materials like paint and fertilizer, is really difficult for a, a pure play non-brick-and-mortar e-commerce company to come in and dominate in home improvement. So we're in a unique space 
that because home improvement customers want to come in and get it today, do a project today, they want to come in and touch it, fill it, they want to come in and talk to an associate to get some product knowledge on how can I do this effectively, can you give me tips on what to buy and how I can install it. So all of those factors makes home improvement a retail format where e-commerce is going to have a difficult time just dominating mm -hmm. the way Am Amazon can maybe dominate apparel or dominate books or dominate music. So, so we look at Amazon, we look at other retailers that have done a really nice job of creating a simple, easy to utilize e-commerce space. So we're benchmarking a, a pretty broad spectrum of competitors to get the best things that they do and incorporating those things into our, our current strategy. So, who, and not to give up any names, but yeah. who would be best in class? Who would you say, you know, they're doing it right for their, their industry? I think you have quite a few. I think Target uh, is, is one retailer that does it exceptionally well. Even in the face of Amazon, because they're Absolutely. directly facing. Absolutely, Target, Best Buy, yeah. okay. Walmart. And, and, and I would include Amazon in that as well. So all of those, brick and mortar slash e-commerce retailers, and we call that omni-channel, where you do a combination mm -hmm. of brick and mortar and a combination of e-commerce. So those omni-channel retailers, Walmart, Best Buy, Target, and, and Amazon as a pure play e-commerce are, are really what I would call best in class retailers that really have figured out how to make e-commerce work and those retailers that have brick and mortar stores also run really good brick and mortar stores. But there, there's no chance that you would, and, and it sounds like I'm, I'm inferring this Mar Marvin from what you're saying, but there's no chance that there would be a day when Lowe's is all online and there, there aren't any of those stores that people like to walk into. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, okay. we don't see that as a remote possibility. I, I think on the next 10 years, Maybe we get to 20, 25% yeah. e-commerce, but, but it's hard for me to see building materials, lumber, garden, appliances, you know, going to you know, a, a strictly e-commerce format. It would be almost impossible to make that happen. Well, one of the aspects of building uh, what you've done, and we go back to the IT campus, is coming out of the ground, as you said, in the south end of the Charlotte, in Charlotte. Um, is when you when you are in all of the markets that you're in the large markets, and we talk about housing, housing problems. Yeah, it would seem like that's a natural place for Lowe's to be cons considered because that's obviously some of your core products. But what is it about housing affordability that made you, even before it became popular two years ago, Lowe's stroked and this again my term Lowe's stroked a seven-figure check for affordable housing in Charlotte because that's close to where your headquarters is. What is it about affordable housing and how, how, how sensitive, how do you think about affordable housing besides just being one of an underwriter or a funder to help? Well, I, I think, look, the part of the American dream is, is owning a home. Uh, owning a home is the equivalent of, of kind of planting roots mm -hmm. in a community. And, and one thing that, that my predecessor and, and Lowe's from a philanthropic standpoint did early on was make a commitment to support you know, an affordable housing initiative here in Charlotte. That's important for us because our business is predicated on home ownership. Uh, we don't do a ton of business with customers that rent property. We do business with the owner of the rental property, but not the actual renter. And, and, and so part of what we want to do as, as really being part of the, of the kind of corporate community of Charlotte is to find a way to, to give individuals who desire mm -hmm. to own a home the ability to do it by making our contribution toward making housing and home ownership more accessible in this community. And, and so that's, that's really more of a philanthropic commitment. But just from a business perspective, you know, home ownership is, is really key to our business growing. But what's interesting is when you look at what macroeconomic measures impact our business versus, let's say, a home builder like D.H. Horton or Lennar, you know, our business is not only predicated on home ownership, it's predicated on home price appreciation. As, as the home value goes up, homeowners feel more comfortable making investments in those homes. And so if your home price is going up, if your neighbor sells their house and, and they make a nice profit, then you're going to feel a lot more comfortable putting in granite countertops or putting in travertine flooring mm -hmm. or, you know, redoing that kitchen or expanding, you know, that, that bathroom in your master bedroom or finishing out your basement. When, when home prices are falling, people look at any investment as an expense and they become very leery. And so we've been very fortunate that just around the U.S., we still see consistent home price appreciation 
which is, is great for our business. And, and another, another little, little known fact is home availability, when there's a shortage of new home availability, that's also good for us. Yeah, yeah. Because if you can't buy a new home, you tend to invest in your current home. And, and you just you just use the term, Marvin, about the idea that and when the economy goes south, then you have another uh, concern. So let's overlay two things here. And we're, believe it or not, we're running out of time. I can't believe it. But um, trade. Yeah. When you were at the top of the house at JCPenney, you went to see the president about trade. Yes. And then on top of that, it's eventual that we will have a downturn. How yeah. do you how do you plan? How do you model a downturn into the Lowe's model? Well, I think for us, two thirds of everything we sell is non-discretionary, meaning that you have to have it. If, if your refrigerator stops working, that's not a discretionary purchase. You have to replace it. If your washer or dryer breaks, you have to replace it. If your roof is leaking, you have to fix it. And so two thirds of what we sell is non-discretionary, which gives us kind of a unique protection against a broad economic downturn. One third, conversely, is discretionary. And so we, we really look at the discretionary spend, and that is a good economic indicator for us on the health of the mm -hmm. economy. Because if that discretionary spend is declining, then that's a signal to us that customers are pulling back on the things that they want to have versus the things that they need to have. Luckily for us, our discretionary spending segment of our business remains pretty strong which means that the non-discretionary is strong as well. So a combination of both. So, so we feel really good about that. Also, relative to how do you prepare for a downturn, you gotta be sharp on your expense management. You can't be frivolous mm -hmm. on what you spend. Uh, you have to continue to hire good people and hire full-time people because you want to have the commitment that those individuals are committed and that they are totally vested in the company, and, and you want those employees to know that they're gonna be around for the good and the bad days. So how does a possible in, in, in length or lengthened trade tiff with China, how does that knock the air out of that? Well, I, th I think for us, we're fortunate that we don't, we don't import a significant amount of our product from China. Uh, we still have a significant domestic supply base, and we also have a very diversified you know, importing strategy that we're not just totally dependent upon China. But we do have a segment of our business that is dependent upon China. And so tariffs are difficult to manage, but thus far, we've been able to protect our consumer mm -hmm. from any dramatic price increases. And, and unless the administration's policy dramatically changes, we believe that we have the ability to manage the current tariff environment where we can protect the consumer from getting increased prices. Mm -hmm. And we're working, as you can imagine, very directly with a lot of our suppliers, making sure that we are partnering with them on steps they can take and that we can conversely take to keep costs down, therefore we can keep retails competitive and we can protect the consumer. Now, if the administration pivots and takes a more aggressive posturing, then we have contingency plans in place that we hope that we don't have to, 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 to implement. Uh, we've got a, about a couple of minutes left, and you know this is not a corporate tactic, it's not a strategy, yeah. it's not what McKinsey would tell you to do. Yeah. But you, uh, we have uh, some uh, common friends, and they say you are a man of faith, and I believe them, I take them at their word, I suspect you are. Yeah. How does that, how does that, whatever that faith is, whatever that belief is, how does it help you day to day? How does it help you interact with the, with the associates? How, yeah. what, what does it do for you? Look, the, the pressures that come along with any big job, especially running a public company, uh, is, can be very you know, immense on any given day, whether it's quarterly earnings or shareholder meetings or board meetings or you know, just engagements with the media. And sometimes those engagements are not as positive as the conversation no, well, we're having. And, and for me, the way I was taught in the little small town I grew up in is there are three things that will determine my success. And this is what my parents taught me from the earliest time I can remember hearing words. Hard work, commitment to education, and faith in God. And so w whenever I feel as though things are a little overwhelming from a natural standpoint, I have a spiritual place I can go. And, and, and I feel as though that I have a level of comfort that I get from my religion. I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, when I address associates, when I end some of my emails, I say God bless because I'm wishing favor and blessings upon them because I've been so blessed in my life. And, and so I'm, I'm someone that embraces my faith. Uh, I don't you know, try to 
convert anybody. I just want them to see how good God has been to me and hopefully that's enough to draw them close to me. And if they want to know why I'm so happy and why I've been successful and why I think that, that, that things for me tend to always work out in the positive, I think part of that is because, you know, I lean on my faith, I work hard, I've, I've really taken all the proper steps to get educated and I believe that God provides us with opportunities the question that I challenge myself on is, are you prepared to take advantage of the opportunity? Yeah. And, and so that's, that's my philosophy. And, and I thank God every day for the blessings of being you know, in this position as the CEO of Lowe's and the ability to work with 310,000 outstanding men and women and, and a blessing to be you know, in a position to try to help them create thank a better you. way of life. Marvin, thank you for your frankness. Thank yeah. you for your leadership and thank you for everything you've done. Please yeah. come back. Pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you for you, inviting sir. me. Thank you. Okay. Until next week, I'm Chris William. We hope your weekend is good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.